Welcome to Analyst Talk with Jason Elder. It's like coffee with an analyst, or it could be whiskey with an analyst reading a spreadsheet, linking crime events, identifying a series, and getting the latest scoop on association news and training. So please don't beat that analyst and join us as we define the law enforcement analysis profession one episode at a time. Thank you for joining me. I hope many aspects of your life are progressing. My name is Jason Elder, and today our guest has two years of law enforcement analysis experience with eight years of law enforcement experience overall. She has spent time with both Fayetteville Police Department and the University of Virginia. She was also a police communication aide for Fairfax County Police Department. She earned a master's degree in criminal justice from Radford. Please welcome Jennifer Cart. Jennifer, how are we doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I am doing very well. How is Virginia? Oh, it's, it's nice. It's good. Looks like the weather outside right now is telling me it's 67. It's sunny, so it's pleasant, not too hot and not too cold. So right in the middle. Yeah, it's a nice uh, chilly here in Florida. We are, missed the hurricane, but oh. we woke up chilly. Yeah, I was going to say, hopefully you're in a safe area. What part of Florida are you in? Tallahassee. Ta- okay. So... But it was odd there for a while because you look mm-hmm. at those cone predictions and Tallahassee was in the center of it for most of the time until just a couple of days before. So I was debating whether I was going to start, you know, boarding up the windows or something like that. But anyway, so very good. Well, I appreciate you being on the show. So how did you discover the law enforcement analysis profession? Well, I think my master's degree at Radford University, I had heard of crime mapping aspect of law enforcement, but in regards to the actual field of analysis, I didn't really hear about it, know about it until I started working for Fairfax County Police Department while I was there. They had a total of seven substations, and each substation had their own analyst for that substation district area, and I started reaching out to the supervisor to try to drop job shadow a crime analyst. And I did job shadow at least two of them in the districts. And then they had a couple level two analysts that were more geared to specific crimes like narcotics or gangs. So I job shadowed another a third analyst that was considered a level two analyst and just became interested in it and started taking classes because I didn't take any GIS classes when I was at Radford University. They didn't offer those. So I started taking those through Fairfax County. They were free to us as an employee. Took quite a few of those, several up to like a 300 level. I was really interested in them, thought they were really a lot of fun to do and also took a lot of Excel classes because I wasn't really familiar with formulas and building pivot tables and going up to that higher level in Excel. So I was taking Excel classes as well to help me prepare to become a crime analyst and that's and just started to apply and then was offered the job down in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Okay. Very good. So then you you also studied criminal justice as an undergrad. So what was your initial goals? So I Got my undergraduate degree at Bachelor of Arts and a minor in Spanish. And then Radford University has an accelerated program where you can do a five-year program and get your master's degree. So that's what I decided to do is go and get my master's degree in criminal justice and finish in five years instead of the normal six years. So in 2009, I graduated with my undergraduate. And so you you are dual enrolled. So in 2009, I was dual to run with dual enrolled as a senior and undergraduate and then started my master's degree. So I was taking day classes during the day for my undergraduate and then my master's classes in the evening time and then graduated in 2010 with my master's in master of science. Okay. And my my goal was to hopefully go federal. That's still probably possibly my dream job is to go federal. But originally I wanted to be like a special agent and now my career path is taking me a different way, which is fine. I enjoy where I'm at. I enjoy being a crime analyst. It's interesting to do different things different days, and it's unexpected what, what I'll be doing from day to day. Okay. And then you, you might have said it, and I just didn't hear it. When you were shadowing the crime analysts there, was that when you were a communication aide for Fairfax County? Yes, that's when I was a police citizen aide for Fairfax County, And I started at the Sully District Station, and I transferred over to court liaison where I was in the court building and and helping officers prepare for court. And so I was on the court side of things in the court building for 
majority of my career at Fairfax County Police Department. Okay, so yeah, let's dive into that job a little bit because that that is fascinating. I'm always interested in pos- jobs that people had before they become mm-hmm. analysts and how they impact what they do as an analyst. So police communication aid, I mean, that's going to open you up to working around a police department and getting to know the records, uh, I'm guessing. Yes, that's correct. And I had other people tell me that I should apply to be in to the analyst position, especially with my master's degree. The police assistant aid position didn't require even a bachelor's degree, just a high school diploma. So luckily they still interviewed me because when I was first looking at it, it was a recession and I had a hard time interviewing because I felt like a lot of employers were looking at me as being overqualified with me having a master's degree mm-hmm. or that I wouldn't stay very long with having a master's degree. But it turned out I was at Fairfax for a little over six years. I definitely had had the connections working in the court building because we had other agencies that came through court, including Virginia State Police, Vienna, Herndon. Those are jurisdictions that reside within Fairfax County. We had Metropolitan Police Department come in, Airport Authority come in. So I got to meet a lot more people than if I stayed at the substation. Mm-hmm. I would just be seeing officers with Fairfax pretty much. So it was a great, and of course, speaking to lawyers, we had close connections with um, sharing information with the Commonwealth Attorney's Office, speaking with clerks in different courts. And prior to me coming over, so I already had experience on the legislative side. I, prior to me getting the full-time position, I worked for the Virginia House of Delegates for four sessions down in Richmond. And that was a really great opportunity, but that was just during the sessions, which were usually like two or three months. And trying to become a legislative aide, was speaking, speaking to people that I knew, trying to a network, but unfortunately there was no openings for me to really get in there as a legislative aide. And I enjoyed my four years there. They contacted me back every year, and I was willing to come back since I didn't have a full-time job yet, and it was a great experience. I was actual clerk for the Militia Police and Public Safety Committee. And it was nice to see the legislative process and bills coming through and going to the House and then going over to the Senate. Side. All right. Ah, oh, that's a lot to unpack there. Going back to the <laughs> court liaison position, certainly working with different people. What kind of tasks are are you doing? So my daily task was really just assisting officers prepare their dockets. So we would have traffic, criminal, juvenile, domestic relations court circuit court. So we would get all the officers' names that were on the docket for the day and notify these officers. They did have access to the general district websites to be able to check their dockets to see if they had anything on the docket for that day. We also had our court scheduling system, which was like an internal for Fairfax County where officers could go check again, another access point for them to be able to check their dockets. We could run criminal histories. So I was VSIN NCIC certified, had to do that Kept up with that every two years, had to recertify. And any other requests that the officer would need, uh, we could do certified copies. If they needed a certified copy from one of the courts, we could get certified copies on a disposition for them. So we were just there really to assist them, anything that they needed, any information that they needed to help find, give them in the right direction of where they needed to go for court. Interesting. And then I guess with the, the clerk, as at the House of Delegates there, like you said, the General Assembly. I mean, that's a that's a fascinating opportunity as well. And to do that for four straight winters. What did you get out of that, do you think, that helped you with your analyst role? Definitely still the connections is when I was working at Fairfax there. One of the delegates was a lawyer and he lived, he was from Fairfax, so I would see him. And he knew who I was from when I was a clerk in a Prior to being a clerk, the first two sessions, I was a committee assistant, which assists the clerks and then became my own clerk, the Pacific committee that I was assigned. It was just nice. I was able to up. So I had to upload the bills into LIS. And so it just allowed me to do more like a 40 hours, get that full time position, get more of that professional experience when I was there, even though it was just temporary. But it was still a valuable time while I was there. I learned a lot. I learned it more of how the legislative process works when I was there. Yeah. Hmm. And then you talked about the shadowing opportunities there. Once you decide that you want to become an analyst and 
and you shadowed. How often did you shadow? Did it was like once a week or how did that all work out? Yeah, so I did one of them I just shadowed for like a day and another analyst I, I job shadowed for an entire week. And she was very resourceful of giving me information of, of like IACA, other analysts to speak to. And the, the analyst that was a level two, and I just job shadowed her for about a day. So my most time was job shadowing the one analyst for an entire week, doing that for an entire week and having enough coverage at court liaison for me, for me to be able to do that. Okay. And yeah, that, I find it fascinating because it, 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 I hear from folks that are trying to become analysts and how difficult and competitive it, some of the jobs are. And I really think any, any experience that you can establish at a police department or a law enforcement agency will help you in the long run. And I think yes. you're a prime example of that through what you've just described in the various positions and volunteer opportunities that you took. Yes, I definitely would agree with that. Definitely trying to prepare myself and get to be able to obtain a position by taking all those training courses that I did to show that I was interested in it by taking those classes and to show on how eager and motivated I was. I was definitely persistent. I applied a few times to become an analyst at Fairfax County Police Department. And the last time I interviewed, they said I did a fabulous job. That I did a great, did great in my interview. But they decided to choose somebody that had 16 years experience. And again, it falls back to when I was applying to just get my foot in the door anywhere for a full time position. I was like, well, I can get the experience if you don't give me the opportunity. <laughs> so it's the same thing with like when I was trying to be an analyst. Well, if you don't give me the opportunity, I can't start to get these years and build these years of experience. So that's when I started applying. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to have to apply to other jurisdictions if it's going to be so competitive here in Fairfax County. And mm-hmm. that's what I did. And and turned out that Fayetteville, North Carolina, wanted to hire me, and I and I decided to take their offer. Nice. And then, so the Fayetteville Police Department job was that was that highly competitive? The interview process. Oh, if I recall, I want to say so. Of course, it was during COVID when when I was interviewed oh, in 2020, right. and I was surprised they still. It was like kind of right when it first started because I interviewed in March of 2020. Mm-hmm. But I was still a little surprised that they decided to have in-person interviews. But I went down there and I did my in-person interview. And once I was hired, I do believe my supervisor at the time did say that they did have quite a few applicants for the position. Narrowed it down and I interviewed. And they, I would, I want to say they probably interviewed between like five and ten people. Mm-hmm. But my supervisor saw how passionate I was, all the training that I took to prepare me for the position. They did have the, just like a generic, kind of like the IACA test that you can find on their website. It was kind of like those questions. So the very generic statistical questions for crime analysis that I, that I took as well in the past. And yeah, it is very, very competitive, but if you just keep being persistent, you'll eventually land where where you need to be and you're supposed to be. So yeah, that's that's interesting. I didn't even think about that for a second there. So you're in person. You, is everybody wearing masks by that point? No, we no no no. no I don't know. We don't know. We do not wear masks. No. Yeah, it's fascinating. That's that's different. <laughs> different states, different roles. I guess some people will be like, "Geez, that was the middle of 2020." And but anyway. <laughs> yeah. and I moved during that time because I moved yeah. down there like in June of that year, 2020. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, well, good. So then you've done all this that you talked about, learning the different t- software, shadowing with the goal in mind of becoming an analyst. Take us back to those first couple of days as you're walking into Fayetteville Police Department for the first time. What was your feeling? Definitely felt a little overwhelmed because I was brand new as being an analyst. Didn't know, I guess, what to expect. But my supervisor was there to help me guide, guide me through the process. She told me that we'd go through a training. We had, I had a checklist of training that she wanted me to go through. And I went through a lot of that. A lot of it was still on my own learning of certain software programs. Like we had Crystal Report. We had, we had so many software programs. I can list like Accurate, Clearview, Clear. So all those I, links. 
was another one that I did have links when I was at Fairfax. So that one I was familiar with. And then TLO was another one that I became familiar with. Of course, was familiar with our RMS system that we had at Fairfax. It was a similar platform as the one in Fayetteville. So I was pretty used to like how to kind of navigate the RMS system. But a lot of it was like learn on your own, a lot of webinars, a lot of GIS classes that I was still taking through Esri that we had access to. We had access to LinkedIn for thin learning. I took a lot of like Crystal, all kinds like Microsoft product, Excel, PowerPoint. I took all kinds of LinkedIn learning has all kinds of programs and classes that you can take that's available. So that's what I was doing during my training. Even after my training three month period, I was still taking those classes, but not as much as now. I was Released and assigned to the aggravated assault and robbery unit. Okay. And then are you the only analyst at the police department? Currently, yes. I'm the only analyst here, but when I was in Fayetteville, North Carolina, we had a total of four analysts. Okay. Supervisor. Okay. Civilian. That was helpful, right? I've talked to some guests that not only were they first-time analysts, but they're the only analysts there. And (laughs) sometimes I've even talked to guests that that was the first analyst job that the police department ever had. So at least in your experience, you had an opportunity to learn from some other analysts at the police department. Right. Yeah, that's definitely true and definitely learned a lot. I had, like I said, a lot of guidance. If I had any questions, I'd either ask my coworkers or go to my supervisor if they weren't able to address them. But here now, I still have, I still have contact now here at the University of Virginia. The previous analyst still works for the University of Virginia, but she's now the Cleary Compliance Analyst. Mm-hmm. Um, she's still here. I'm just in now in a different role at the university, so I can still reach out to her and speak to her. And she did meet with me a couple couple days when I first started to go over some things, show me some things, provide me some information. But it is nice kind of being the only analyst. You can kind of do whatever you, you want. You don't have anybody saying, oh, why don't you do it like this? Why don't you <laughs> format it like how I format it? So it's nice to be able to like, just kind of have the freedom, the creativity. Of course, if, you know, command staff doesn't like what I provide, I'll, I'll change to what, what they like. But I feel like I have more of a freedom of to be able to go where I want and take this analyst role where I want to. I'm the only analyst. Could possibly potentially grow it to where there's a couple more analysts maybe down the road. Get to maybe another, maybe a supervisor that's just civilian position instead of a command staff have over the unit. But so there's a lot of, I think, a lot of potential here at the University of Virginia to expand our crime analysis unit. Okay. Well, just a couple more questions with the Fayetteville side. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you were put in, would you say robbery unit? Yes, I was. Just, so when once I finished pretty much going through like a three month training period to get comfortable doing some ride alongs and getting comfortable with the RMS system and running reports and taking some training, I was cut loose and my supervisor adjusted some things and she felt comfortable that I would be a good fit to be assigned to the robbery and ag assault unit. Okay, so in that I'm assuming then that's mostly case support. Yes, that's correct. But we did have roles where we could overlap each other. So we each had a backup analyst that if they were out for the day and not at work, we would be their backup for their work. So my backup of the other analyst, she did social media OSINT searching. So she would send out usually like a weekly, sometimes usually a weekly of social media events that she would find and send that through email to notify command staff of events. And she also did booking and releases. So she would get an email from the jail and create a, a Word document of all the, the ones that were released. And we would categorize them based off the, we had three districts in Fayetteville. And we would base them off the districts and provide all the information of what the charges were when they were released. So that's another thing I'd also would follow up on was that if she was out. But yeah, my my sole duty was the robbery and ag assault unit. I did everything again, going through any searches that they need, all those systems that I mentioned, running any reports. If they wanted to report, usually ran them through Crystal, started doing mapping, especially hot streets mapping was something that I started taking on. Did analyst notebook to create Niven charts, which is gun shell casings. Okay. to link them to each case. So a lot of different avenues that I I was doing uh, in Fayetteville definitely kept me busy. 
So I, I think I find it fascinating that test that you were there because most of the time when I think of social media or OSIN at a police department, it's directly involved in case support there. But it almost sounds like that position was also like a you know, strategic task in like bringing self-awareness to potential threats to the to the area right yes yeah the, yes we definitely had certain party promoters that would hold events in Fayetteville and unfortunately some of those events during them or after them they they would lead to shootings so just yeah trying to give them awareness of where these events were being held at to give you know the police department to kind of monitor to patrol those areas during those times that they they were having these events yeah now were you all using special software or was it you know, just a matter of signing up for the different social mm -hmm. media platforms. Yeah, I've heard of one, and I can't remember the name of the one that they used to use here at the University of Virginia. The emergency management still, I think, has a, a platform that they use for social media, but the police department no longer has it. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, so it was the same thing in Fayetteville. I, I did have my own undercover, like Facebook, Instagram, but I didn't ever increased any others, but the other analyst that focused more on social media, she did have the other social media aspects of like Snapchat and TikTok that she searched, but I mainly just searched if I needed to, like Instagram and Facebook were like our two biggest ones to search. Yeah. And then yeah. of course like TweetDeck, TweetDeck you don't have to have an account for, so TweetDeck I would use as well. Yeah. Now, did you take any special training there or there? I, I'm guessing there must be something you were at least told on the do's and don'ts of what you what you should and shouldn't be doing in terms of this type of tasks. Yes. I mean, of course, one to like all the policies and general orders that that's like first thing that I, that I did, like in my first three months was having to go through any of those orders and, and read through them and sign off on them. And then other training was just kind of like signing up for there of course everything during this time was virtual nothing was like in person as it is starting to come back now but generally did, did the IACA conference and just signed up for the, those classes when they had it last year was there anything in particular that you remember from that training that stuck sticks out well it was before the conference one but IACA did have one when I was assigned the task to pick up the project of the hot street they I reached out to another analyst in California that my supervisor gave me a contact that knew how to create the hot streets to reach out to him that to because I didn't know how to create them. I had never heard of the concept hot streets. I had heard the concept of hot spots. So it was a new concept for me. So I was, what can I learn? And then going out and learning on my own, research my, on my own, and contacted him. And he told me about IACA was going to be having a webinar in like a couple of weeks from when he emailed me for how to create hot streets. So I took that class, took notes on it. And then from there, I was able to take that information and apply it into my arc map to be able to create these hot streets. It took a little time. Some days it was a little frustrating, but I did get it. I did get the hot streets and I was very proud of myself. <laughs> <laughs> the, the command staff, the assistant chief was very pleased and that, and that was a project that I stayed with until I left and I switched over from arc map to arc pro to, cause it, it became easier to do it in arc pro is why I switched over from map to pro to be able to, um, create the joins and, um, for the hot streets. Hi everyone. This is Dr. Leanne Perry. I have a public service announcement. Don't get so set in your way of thinking that you don't allow yourself the flexibility to grow in your thoughts. Be willing to consider other people's viewpoints and critically think through them. Changing your mind is not the end of the world. Keep your mind open enough so that it's at least a possibility. Hello, I'm Barry Fosberg, the Senior Analyst with Houston Police Department. I'm here to do a PSA for regional associations. If you're an IACA or familiar with IACA, get in, find out if you have a local association. And if for no other reason your crooks don't know you have borders, your borders typically have other crime analysts, and this is a great way to know them by name. So the task was to do the hot streets as opposed to a hot spot or density analysis. Why was it hot streets as opposed to other forms of displaying 
densities. So from when I spoke to the assistant chief, that's what he really wanted to do. He wanted to dive down into it deeper instead of just kind of the neighborhood level, which is more hot spots. He wanted to dive down into it even further to more specifically to the actual streets that were having these incidences. And specifically, I was doing shots fired. So I was plotting calls for service for shots fired is what he wanted to know and took it from there and was doing updates for once months passed by. They wanted to have updates of new data. So I was filtering in from the same map and just adding the new data to it and plotting it and was something that they wanted to be able to incorporate in our, we had weekly ComStat meetings. They wanted to incorporate that into the weekly ComStat meetings. And that was still in the works when I, as I, as I was leaving, but that was the ultimate goal is they wanted to have eventually get like an interactive map to be able to use as well, maybe on patrol, but they did want to have it displayed and used in our ComStat meetings. What kind of different data sets were you looking at with this? Like, were you looking at, for instance, the difference between shots fired out in the street versus shots fired inside a building? So I was looking at really any call service that was shots fired, but I did exclude anything that came, that any call service that was actual, like an actual fireworks, those were excluded. Mm-hmm. And I was using, to plot the information instead of based off of address, I was using Latin long. So all the information that I used, I was using the Latin long information to be able to plot it into the North Carolina plane. But then you were in looking at it from different angles in terms of the different types of cases? No. So they, so it was just the calls for service, just pulling data that was just calls for service that were, that was listed as shots fired. Okay. Again, yeah. omitting the ones that were actual fireworks was, is where I would categorize or uh, specify to, to remove those ones that were fireworks okay. and not actual like shots fired calls. Yeah. And you, and you mentioned in the prep call, that in the beginning, the way you were doing it was way more difficult than the way you eventually learned how to do it. Can you talk about both, how you were doing it originally and then the way easier way that you discovered how to do it? Yes. Yeah, so in ArcMap, uh, it was a couple step process. I had to create a join. And so I don't remember what the Pacific, but I had to pretty much to, to Make it simple. I had to I had to join the layers to each other, and if I didn't join the layers correctly, it wouldn't plot the actual lines mm-hmm. of where it was showing the hot spots. So you had to make sure that you were matching up the right join, and then so I had to do it, it twice. So I created one join, but then that wasn't the that wasn't the only step. Then I had to create a second join, and then finally by that. The third time I went in, that's when it would create the hot streets, and that's when I would have my hot streets layer. And then when I switched over to Pro, talking to GIS and and finding out how to create it in Art Pro, all I had to do in Art Pro was do account if, and that was just a one-step process of a join. You just plug in the layers that you had in there from with the calls for service shots fired to the streets, and that would create your hot streets layer. Uh, so it was just a one one process, one step compared to a map, which was like I said, more difficult. Had a couple steps. It was it was, was very confusing if you didn't understand what you were doing. Yeah. So definitely Arc Pro is definitely a lot easier to be able to create a hot streets layer. Yeah. So was the calls for service multiple layers or just one? Just so I could separate them out because I did do eventually like a five. I started out with like I think a three month for the assistant chief, and then I eventually went to like a like a three or five year baseline if I recall. And those years I did separate out into a known its own separate layer to distinguish year to year and then be able to if, and also to be able to show it on the map separately if you wanted to instead of showing them all at once so you could then be able to see each layer year by year by selecting all of them at once or if you wanted to just see a couple layers but separated them out yeah year to year okay and then you mentioned comstat did you look at them at the classic Seven day, twenty eight day, year to date. Yeah. We, ours was seven days because we had it weekly, so uh-huh. our turnaround was on was seven days. We had it held it every Wednesday. Mm-hmm. That's how they had done it for I was told for a long time. <laughs> and my supervisor would have preferred it be more like a monthly time staff, but command staff 
chief wanted it to be weekly, so it stayed on weekly. Yeah, so it went week, weekly. So I find that funny because that's several, we were, when I was an ALS 20 years ago, that's what the way we were doing it too. So it's fascinating that that's still the standard and that, you know, sometimes it's, I think with Comstat police departments and you get those weekly meetings that, and you, I think it's a, this is a perfect example with the data that you're looking at, that you're only going to look at the number of, of hits on a particular street segment for that particular time. And it seems like that's all they're focused on. And I'm not saying you did this, but it seems like there wasn't anything further done than that, like how those are related to other crimes or other incidents or why they're mm -hmm. important. It's just like if they have four, that that means they're going to get talked about kind of thing and what's going on with that. And it seems like they're more focused on the four than really trying to understand why maybe one of them is important and not the other three. Yes, yeah. And I think that was like kind of our standpoint of it that really to, to see or to do a tactical analysis. It needs to be more than a week. You can't really go week by week to really see a turnaround or make an impact, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And I know during one of our concept meetings, I had presented information because another concept meeting, they said that shot, shots fired calls, which was what I was, of course, focused on, was had gone up in recent months. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't believe that's correct. And they didn't have any, like, you know, nothing to really back it up on. So I, I, I decided to take it in my own hands and started to pull the data for shots fired. And, and I had taken an Excel course and I was able to do like, like a threshold analysis to show, you know, the years previously to what it will be like in the future. And the shots fired calls for those months that they were saying had increased it fell within that threshold that it wasn't above being high. Mm -hmm. And then I, of course, I, I, my supervisor wanted me to present that in the cops that meeting and I did, but it's still, they still <laughs> didn't want to listen to the evidence and an analysis that I had given and still were saying that shots fired calls were high. So that's interesting because that's almost, did you run a statistical test against that data? That almost sounds like a Z score. Yeah, so it was it was kind of like a formula that that I had learned from taking an Excel course on like threshold analysis and like forecasting. And that's what I was doing was forecasting and doing a threshold analysis. And so all I do was just plug in my own. Once I once I ran my data, all I had to do was plug it into these formulas and into the spreadsheet example that that I was given during this class, and and of course generate the charts. And that's all I had to do because all the formulas were already there for me to be able to do this threshold and like forecasting analysis. But yeah. and then, was that law enforcement class that you were taking or was that just a standard class that you were taking at a university? It, it was either, I don't know if it was an IACA one, but it was like a webinar based one. It was either IACA possibly, or it might've been, because I did take some IACA courses, the mm -hmm. essential skills class training. I finished that like as I was still, when I first started at Fayetteville, I had started it when I was at Fairfax and then completed that course, which is like a 12-week course to help prepare me if I ever take my certificate in crime analysis. So I took the part one IACA essential skills course, and then I've also taken the part two essential skills course. So I think it might have been in the part two essential skills course that we had, we had that threshold and forecasting spreadsheet information given to us. Okay. So was it one of those deals where, you know, it might, when you looked at the numbers, maybe month to month or compared like this August, the last August, it was up a little bit, but it wasn't up <laughs> enough right, to yeah. actually be right, significant. Correct. Right. Okay. Yes, correct. It, it was showing that the numbers were h higher, but again, when you did the chart, it did go up, but it didn't go out of that threshold of being, you know, above above the line of the statistical analysis of the Z score. So really, that, that's what I was trying to show that it it's not going out, you know, crazy beyond the scope of. Uh, it was still it was still within that normal range. Yeah. Uh, so, so I guess those that were saying that it's high, what were they recommending that the police department do? Hmm. Or were they just saying it's higher and we should do something about it? <laughs> but I remember them saying it was higher. Don't 
Right now, I cannot recall what they okay. I wanted just, to do to re really address it, but I was just curious. Huh? That's that's interesting. And then, so th yeah. So as you mentioned, that you did this all the way up until you left Fayetteville. And earlier this year, you took a position at the University of Virginia. So I guess talk about that transition. Why did you leave Fayetteville for the University of Virginia? So I, well, I'm originally from Richmond, Virginia. That's where I grew up. That's where my family's from. So I was about three hours away in Fayetteville, North Carolina, to home. And this position is closer to home. I'm only a little over, and if I'm from work, a little about an hour away where I live. A little further west, I'm about almost an hour and a half away, so closer to home where I live now. I was familiar with the University of Virginia. I've been here for a couple of football games against Virginia Tech. I'm a Virginia Tech fan. They all know that here. My dad graduated <laughs> from Virginia Tech, so we are, UVA is a rivalry with Virginia Tech. But well, I'm glad they didn't hold that against you. Yeah, no, I don't know. The first they wanted to, I feel like in our Oasis meeting, like he, my supervisor at the time had to announce it to everybody in, in our Oasis, which is like a comstat meeting. I probably had like 20 some people. So I'm like, that's fine. They're going to know either way. I'm going to, you know, wear my orange and maroon and I have a Virginia Tech purse. So it's fine. And I had done an internship when, in my master's degree at the university, or I'm sorry, at Virginia Commonwealth University during my master's degree. And I enjoyed that campus setting, thought it was different and unique, and I enjoyed it. And I was like, I think I would like to maybe go back to a campus setting. And they they have a lot of great opportunities, I think, at the a university level. Of, we have intramural sports that I can attend, of classes. I can take classes and I get you know, tuition money to pay towards those classes. So there was a lot of incentives that came with the university that I also liked about it. And and my interviewing and and I had an interview with the chief before I was hired, and it just felt right. I felt that I, that I would be appreciated here at the university. And sometimes being down in Fayetteville, I didn't feel like I was appreciated with with the you know work that I was pushing out. So I didn't feel like I was being, I guess, as valued as much as I would be here at, at the University of Virginia. And, and, I, and I'm proud of my decision, and I, it was worth the move, and I, I've, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so that's that's interesting. Did you have much pushback there at Fayetteville then? You mentioned that you weren't appreciated. No, I didn't have much pushback. I kept my so my supervisor that that was in Fayetteville. She had taken a new position like a couple of months prior to me, like more in the summertime is when she left, and I left in February mm -hmm. of this past year. But she left over the summertime, and the new supervisor was a previous analyst that, that's been there 10 years and she she deserved to be the new supervisor and she was doing great in the position when when she did take over that position and I kept her informed of when I started interviewing just to, to let her know of when she'd be able to potentially start having to interview if I did get the position so and she was happy for me she she knew that, you know, Fayetteville is, is a police department that does turn over, not just like mm -hmm. civilians, but officers as well, that it's like a stepping stone, so to speak, if you want to call it that. And they knew that. And yeah, it was not somewhere I wanted to stay permanently. Fayetteville was not my long-term goal, that it was to get the experience. And I had great opportunities there to learn and grow and have training. And I, I learned a lot. And this opportunity presented itself and I applied and, and, came to back to Virginia. All right. Interesting. So then what kind of tasks are you doing at the University of Virginia? So I'm doing a lot of the similar things. I don't have as much software that I did down in Fable North Carolina. Like I don't have clear view. I don't have clear. I do have TLO and I do have links. Those are really the only two I have. And of course I do have like my undercover social media accounts as I did in, in, in Fayetteville. This I'm probably doing more data pooling. I did do data pooling in, in Fayetteville, but here I feel like I'm doing more statistical data pooling for command staff. Tens probably about the same. I did do a few bulletins down in Fayetteville, maybe done like a couple more here, but. I haven't done as much mapping. I've done a little bit of mapping, but not as much as I was doing down in Fayetteville either with like the shop, like hot streets. Yeah. So what are what are the major issues there for the university that you're focusing on? So the university, so the difference between a university setting and 
local or state or city law enforcement is the universities after the incident at Virginia Tech, the, they implemented the Cleary Act. Mm-hmm. The Cleary Act is a set of kind of like the UCR codes for the FBI, but the Cleary Act is a list of crimes that the universities have to abide by and, and to report. It falls within the Cleary Act geography. So that I'm still learning. I do have like formal training signed up in November to become more familiar with that. But that's like the biggest difference is trying to learn that. Of course, still like the geography of, of where, cause we have a joint patrol area. At the university, which is the university's, University of Virginia Police Department's jurisdiction as well as the city. So the city of Charlottesville's jurisdiction. So they have an overlapping area. Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to learn that and how to pull that data can sometimes be a little difficult. But yeah, definitely the Clery Act, because that was something I hadn't heard of before. And I remember them asking me if I knew what the Clery Act was. And I said, to be honest with you, I'm not going to sit here and guess. I probably could guess what it is, but I'm I'm just going to tell you I don't know what it is. Yeah. So and that's what I did. <laughs> I didn't know what it was. I, was like, I can take a guess. I'm probably it's probably has to do with like the laws and and the incident types of crime. But I was like, I'm not going to sit here and guess you and tell you what it, tell you what it is. But no, I, I for some reason I am familiar with it, and I can't remember why I would have been made familiar with it. I mean, I. It's Clary, I believe, was a a female student that was murdered on campus, on a campus, and the Mm -hmm. family found out that the university had a crime problem, but it no, at that time you couldn't find any statistics on the university for crime. So the Clary Act requires universities to publish crime stats on right. their campus. Yes. And so I and it's interesting I don't know and maybe you know this so there, there's obviously there's the exact boundary of the university and then mm-hmm. there's, there's just the outskirts that would be considered just outside the university but it would be probably city jurisdiction but that's where a lot of college students live you know that's off campus Mm -hmm. housing i guess you would say do you have to report just outside the jurisdiction of campus so we our clery act includes sidewalks Mm -hmm. so so when we get reports or we get like shift reports that are sent out by email and the, and the, our report will say it, it re- was located or occurred in the Cleary Act geography. Mm-hmm. So yes, if an incident occurs on the, the sidewalk that's along where our, our boundary lies, that then it, it becomes ours. If it is not in our, let's say then it, or if it happens like in the, in the building, like let's say a bar there, cause there's bars that, that are not our jurisdiction and it occurs in the bar. Then that is not the clear geography because it's it's not part of the university, but if it occurs on the sidewalk. As far as I understand, it, I'm still learning, but that's what I've been told. If it, if it does occur on the sidewalk, that is clear geography and needs to be reported. Yeah, it's, it's but I'm not an expert on that. That's why we got our clear compliance <laughs> unit section that are they they are better with that than I am. So yeah, that's, it does get confusing, but that's that's I do know at least like that's the basic of what I've been told, and yeah. Yeah, and it's certainly a lot better to get access to information now. You know, a lot of police departments publish their crime stats on the website and yes, yes, usually yeah, we... get access to that. I mean, it's it's interesting because any campus in America, you you bring that up and you're probably going to run into something that's going to make you worry as you send your son or daughter <laughs> to that campus. But you know. Yeah, and we yeah, the University of Virginia does have their crime log for each month. You can you can click on the link and it will it will give you like all the list of incidents that have occurred for each month. So that's that's nice to be able to have available. And they're very clear about making sure things are reported correctly because we also have title nine that and again that's something that i have very basic knowledge about it with title nine I don't, they have title nine meetings but i don't intend those but title nine is the other thing that's also like different from university police department to just a normal law enforcement agency is title nine as well is that the one with gender or is that um, which title? i forget which one title nine is are you googling it real quick <laughs> yeah it prohibits sex-based discrimination in any school or any other education program that receives funding from the federal government so that's what title nine is okay 
All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like I said, I don't, just very basically familiar with that. So certainly dealing with the stats and dealing with the requirements for a university. Are you also working on special projects if there's special events at the university or I, I guess football is now going on. Is that something that you're involved in as well? Yes. So with Ellie involved in graduation weekend, that's in May. We were, we have like command posts and when we have command posts set up, that, that includes us, that includes emergency management department, includes other areas of the university, usually our RMC, which is like the staff that supports us on grounds. They're there. So it's a big network of all of us getting together. Usually we will pull in the city police, state police as well, for definitely like graduation, big events. And when the first couple of months after I was here, we had Mike Pence here for a, an event. And so that was another command post today. We do have Kelly Ann Conway coming. She'll be speaking at seven today. So that's another one. We don't have a command post set up today without looking at any concerns or anything, but I'll be here through this evening to do like social media intel monitoring for it is usually what I do for those events and emergency management. Also does the same thing. They also will go, will monitor any threats or concerns on their end as well and communicate with each other. We have, we have a University of Virginia has a VOC is the name of it, the website where we are all grouped together in there. We can post information on there to, so it's like on one place where we can all communicate and I have to like send emails. So that's kind of nice where we can all just be in one, one room, so to speak, to be able to um, post information on, on certain events. Okay, and I'm sure you're doing the social media stuff as as these events are going on as well, right? Right, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, definitely for like the event today when I, Mike Pence was here, kind of sometimes I'll, I'll do like for the football games and let them know if I see anything else or any other threats or concerns to the university, I'll pass it along to command staff. And then other projects that I've done, once for our COPS program, which is our community or policing that they implemented like back last year before I started here, they implemented that. And so I pulled data like prior to that unit starting and then post unit starting and pulled a lot of data for the previous deputy chief that was here. That was in the first like couple months and it was a big data pool. So I had the previous analyst help me pull some of that data, but you definitely have done a variety of things with that in the bulletins as well. Like I said, I've done bulletins for attempt to identify. We've had a big one recently where they now publicly listed it and offering like a $10,000 reward to identify the individual. So any requests that they have, bulletins, data pulling, helping officers by social media accounts, assisting the detectives. I can... One new thing I do here at the university is I do a police lineup. So I've created a couple of those okay. for the sergeants for a lineup. And it's pretty simple, just pulling photos that look similar to the description of the suspect and, and giving me usually like five or six photos and giving them to the detective sergeant. I gotcha. Yeah, I'm just thinking about put, pulling data from all the college IDs. <laughs> so I'm, sure, <laughs> I'm sure some of those college IDs are funny. So, but certainly I have had guests on this show that are analysts of a police department that is part of a college town. And so certainly they work hand in hand with the university. But in terms of your position, do you know how many other universities in the country have their own analysts? Mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious mm -hmm. is how unique this situation is with mm -hmm. you and the University of Virginia. Yeah, that's, that's a, an answer I do not have right now, but I'm curious to know. I do. I just re, I just got one actually today from where I did my internship from the Virginia Commonwealth University. They sent out a bulletin day, bulletin today. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not sure. Some not, usually they do have an analyst that, that's who will create those bulletins. And if not, then it's usually a detective that will create them. Mm -hmm. But it was sent out by the Virginia Commonwealth University. And then usually like for mine, I will put created by and I, and I will enlist. J Cart analyst, crime analyst, but they didn't have theirs listed, so I'm not sure if it's if an actual analyst did it or if it was a detective. But yeah, I don't know of because we were I work closely with the surrounding jurisdiction, which is the city of Charlottesville, Albemarle County PD. So we are all in the same RMS system. Mm -hmm. 
So I've definitely reached out to them to be able to get familiar with our RMS system here since we're all under the same RMS. And it's nice because then I can, if I need to, I don't have to request a report from them. I can just search a case number and it will bring it up since we're all on the same system. Um, so that's, not, that's a nice feature. But the other universities that I'm not sure, but I do know to be, because we are Virginia, University of Virginia is CALEA accredited. Mm-hmm. And I get, and I guess the standard for CALEA accreditation is you, the department has to have a crime analyst to be CALEA accredited. Uh, you know what? I remember that used to be the rule, but I actually thought they went away from that. Um, you may be right. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's the the case anymore because there definitely was a big push from it for that, and a lot of police departments hired analysts for that mm-hmm. very purpose. So that's interesting. You may mention RMS. And that's always a fun one when you go, do you like your current RMS or is it is it something that you wish was better? Yes. So it's a different platform than what I'm used to. Um, mm-hmm. I'm still trying to like learn it and navigate it and try I, I signed up to take training classes through, so ours is called New World mm-hmm. Law Enforcement Records. And the agency that's through is called Tyler Tech. So I signed up through like their Tyler Tech University to take classes, but I haven't had the chance to really be able to take time to go take any of them. So I'm just kind of again learn as you go is what I've been doing, and it's been for the most part because sometimes my previous RMS systems they would freeze on me. So this one luckily doesn't freeze as much <laughs> as my other ones sometimes did. So that's one good thing. But some of it is I know I've had some issues because we do have a section where you can do data analysis. Mm-hmm. And I can edit queries, so I can go in where somebody's already, like the previous analyst has already built a query. I can edit it to what I want and filter it and change, like, the date parameter and, and other things. But I have had issues where I've had to contact Tyler Tech, and I still have a ticket out now where I was trying to run calls for service. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to have the affiliation information, which is if the individual is UVA affiliated as a student, non-UVA affiliated or an employee. And I was getting an error message that wasn't returning anything, wasn't really understanding what the error message was telling me, so I reached out to them. And again, like I said, they they eventually got to where it was like on the server side, and I'm still waiting for a follow-up. I need to reach out to them to follow up to see what the issue was. So there's been a couple of times where I try to run a query and it and it won't run. It gives me this you know, crazy error messages that I'm like, what is that supposed to mean? Yeah. What's that, tell- what that telling me? Yeah. So I'm imagining there at the university, in terms of the calls for service and the crime reports, certainly ha- how many are you dealing with in a day or kind of put that in perspective? I don't know how. It, is there a measurement? I'm obviously guessing that the, the amount of data that you're dealing with at the university Virginia is way lower than what you were dealing with in Fayetteville. But so how yes. many, just how many records are you usually dealing with on a daily basis? Yeah. So not, not definitely not as many as Fayetteville. Mm-hmm. Uh, our crimes at the university is, is more, so we have the, the hospital here. So we do have a lot of calls. If you're looking at calls of service for like assist agency, which mm-hmm. is like assisting the city a lot of times. So we have a lot of assist agencies, assist civilian calls but if we're talking like actual crimes we have you know ours is more like larcenies motor vehicle thefts have gone up because now the fbi ucr and the cleary act now categorize anything with an electric motor so that includes scooters mopeds electric bike those are all now considered motor vehicle thefts Uh so that's why our that's why our numbers if you look at it at it that's what that's why they've gone up because they recategorize what is what is considered a motor vehicle. And we do have a lot of scooters and a lot of mopeds, so that's why they, that number has gone up. But so, what are you looking forward to? Do you have something that you're planning on with this position? What do you hope to achieve in the next couple of years? So I'm hoping to implement more software programs. I've done a request to get Power BI. And if I don't get Power BI, I've also submitted a request for Tableau. Because mm-hmm. I was when I went to the IACA conference this year in Chicago, I was sold on getting Tableau. That <laughs> it's like just pretty much all automated. I'm like, yes, that's that's what I need. Because <laughs> Power BI, you still of course had to like build and make templates to be able to pull the data. So Tableau would be great. And I know the university itself has when I've looked up information that 
that I've seen where they have stats and numbers that they use the, the Tableau software. But so I'm hoping to get that. I would just like to make things more automated and more streamlined to be able to focus on other things. Because right now, my, to pull Oasis data, that luckily we only have it monthly. But for me to pull that data, I have about 15 slides that I pull of data for patrol, and it's all manual. So oh. it, it, I had to focus probably about a good two or three days right now still. I know that previous analyst, she said it only took her a day, but she was in the position for five years. So she became to be able to do it quickly, but something where I can like more streamline it because Fayetteville, they would be able to, they had a SQL server where they had these reports already built in. So all you had to do was change the date parameter on it and hit click and that would give you all your data numbers. That's where I would like to eventually get with that and some other manual reports that were manual that I would like to streamline that I'm working now with a Excel spreadsheet to, to build an access to connect to, to be able to pull data. That would be like a weekly thing. So that's still in the work, still working on that, but that's where I'd like to eventually get to and just help building the software because the analyst here, she used Excel to pull all the data in. And I did once I, a month or two after starting, I did pull, pull the SQL server ODBC connection into access. So I had built some forms in there, but it's still nothing fantastic. But I did at least pull it, pull it into access to have that as an option because she didn't have it in access. All right. Good. Well, let's finish up with personal interests. I found on LinkedIn that you once volunteered for the Fairfax World Police and Fire Games. Yes, that's correct. And I think, I want to say I thought they held it every year. I could be wrong on that. But I did do it when I was there at Fairfax. It did come to Northern Virginia that, I don't remember what year, but during that time I was at Fairfax and was interested. I couldn't participate or I probably would have participated, but I couldn't participate as a civilian. Only sworn law enforcement could participate. But as, as a civilian, I could still volunteer. So I volunteered at the like gun gun range is where they assigned me. I was trying to, I signed up for, I tried to sign up for a couple of like basketball and some others, but that's where they put me and it was fun. I did that. I think I was there like two, two days, like half days and met people. And there was people, of course, all around the world that were there. And I went to the open ceremony that they had. That was really interesting to watch and see. So it was a good experience, but I think, I want to say, I thought they held it every year. And of course they have it different places every year or maybe every four years but it's it's really cool i definitely recommend if you get a chance to go to it so is there i i had never heard of a police and fire game so is this where police officers and firefighters are competing against each other or is there a section for police and a section for fire so I think it depended on like which category you were mm-hmm. you were in, like because I know they had like basketball, so that would be like a team thing. Mm-hmm. But then they did have like the individual sports, like where I was at with the gun the gun shooting thing. But it really was just for all good fun. But yeah, I mean it was a competition, but it's for to me it was just like oh let's just all get together and have some fun playing these games. Yeah. Now, now you, you had mentioned that you would have participated. Did is that what would you have participated in if if you did? Probably would have done basketball because I did basketball in high school, so nice. I like I like basketball. So I probably would have done that. I trying to remember if they had dodgeball listed. I mean, would have done dodgeball, but definitely remember I would have probably done basketball. But you got on the gun range. Are you uh, experienced in shooting? No, I'm not. I've done I've done skeet shooting when yeah. I was at Rafford. I was in the Criminal Justice Club, a member yeah. of Criminal Justice Club, and also the member of Lambda Alpha Lambda Alpha Epsilon co-ed fraternity. And we did skeet shooting. So I've done skeet shooting, but I've never done like handgun shooting, like at, at the range or anything. I want to. It's on my list, but I just haven't gotten gotten to it yet. All right, good deal. All right. Well, our last segment to the show is Words of the World, and this is where I give the guests the last word. Jennifer, you can promote any idea that you wish. What are your words to the world? My words are just just never give up. Be persistent. If you are passionate about becoming a crime analyst, it eventually will happen when it's meant to be. And always keep learning in this position. You'll never stop learning. There's, all, there's always some new technology to learn. So just be open-minded and always, and always willing to learn new things and, and take those training classes. Very good. Will I leave every guest with you? You've given me just enough to talk bad about you later? Yes. 
<laughs> I do appreciate you being on the show, Jennifer. Thank, Thank you, you so much, and you be safe. Thanks, you too. Have a good one.